Hi, my name is Peter Chiarelli. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon at USC and CHLA, Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Uh, this discussion is on pediatric diffuse brainstem tumors. Pediatric brainstem tumors arise in many forms. For example, the images you're seeing here uh, represent a diffuse tumor. However, these tumors can also appear very circumscribed. And furthermore, they can grow away from the back, the dorsal side of the brainstem, as in this dorsal exophytic tumor seen here. Not all brainstem tumors behave in a similar way. Understanding the difference between these types is essential for providing an appropriate prognosis and an appropriate treatment plan, including surgical treatment when necessary. First off, let's talk about some demographics and certain classification schemes for brain stem tumors in pediatric population. From the most current data uh, from the United States, brain stem tumors represent 10.9% of all new central nervous system neoplasms in kids aged 0 to 19. Uh, just by comparison, these tumors of the brainstem make up 1.5% of brain, brain tumor or central nervous system tumors overall in adults. There are approximately 500 new cases per year based on the most updated statistics and, in pediatrics, and a new diagnosis of brainstem tumor is most common between the ages 5 to 9. Masses in the brainstem display a substantial degree of histologic heterogeneity. And really, diffuse tumors are the most lethal pediatric high-grade tumors by location within the brain or spine. Other, other brainstem tumors that are more focal um, in nature are known to have a quite favorable prognosis in comparison. So looking to get at characteristics of histology or prognosis from non-invasive data, tumor location and imaging appearance have historically been analyzed quite extensively. Over the past three decades, Certain classification schemes for brainstem tumors in the pediatric population have evolved um, with terminology that you see here. And for today's discussion, we'll focus only on this category of masses, the diffuse brainstem tumors. The most relevant dividing line really remains between masses that are diffuse on imaging versus those that are well circumscribed. And a discussion of diffuse tumors is essentially a discussion of DIPG, uh, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. DIPG is an invasive neoplasm that tends to originate in the pons, and it represents 75% approximately of all pediatric brainstem tumors. Even, um, or it represents the most aggressive pediatric primary brain, brain tumor, and even with the best available treatment, it has a dismal prognosis. Some statistics on prognosis for DIPG include a median overall survival of 8 to 12 months, a one-year progression-free survival of approximately 20%, a mean overall survival at one year of 45%, and a mean overall survival at two years uh, that's extremely low. What's more is that the change in overall survival over the past three decades has been just about 0%. Some actual actuarial measures for DIPG include a median age for a new diagnosis around six to seven years, and a peak in incidence from between ages three to nine years. Do note that a second peak in incidence occurs in adults um, at an age of about 34 years um, with a very different progression-free progression survival and overall survival compared to that of the pediatric population, approximately five times greater. Overall, DAPG occurs about equally in males and females. So given the limited options for treatment and the challenging nature of the tumor location, uh, the motivation has long existed to reliably and non-invasively identify DAPG. In cons in, as a consequence of this, the semantic entity, typical or classic DIPG, um, has arisen and is very important to understand because historically it's had a role as a surrogate for tissue diagnosis. The utility of this framework, the typical or classic nomenclature, is its positive predictive association with histologically confirmed DIPG. And this association in practice has been well documented in cases with these typical features. So the question then becomes, what defines a typical DIPG? A typical or classic DIPG has a definition that occasionally is controversial, but a reasonable description includes certain clinical features. These would include a short symptomatic course prior to presentation, cranial nerve signs, cerebellar signs, for example, ataxia, certain long track signs that may be present, like weakness or hyperreflexia, and extraocular movement disorders. Certain typical or classic radiographic features include a central location of the mass within the pons, where the tumor itself occupies greater than half of the pons itself, um, a lack of well-defined outer margins, 
hyperintensity on T2 weighted MRI and hypointensity on T1 weighted MRI, a lack of significant enhancement. There may be enhancement within the tumor, but the enhancing region itself comprises less than 25% of the tumor volume and engulfment of the basilar artery. Certain features are cited as atypical in cer certain circumstances, and these can include prominent enhancement, restricted diffusion, cystic components, and a prominent exophytic component. But again, occasionally these are controversial. So how does characterization of a DIPG as either typical or atypical impact the decision uh, for future treatment and the decision to biopsy? So the decision-making process for stereotactic biopsy can differ between neurosurgeons. Prior to the general availability of MRI and modern stereotaxy that we'll talk about in a minute, the rates of morbidity and mortality for brainstem biopsy were thought to be near 30% morbidity and 4% mortality, very high numbers. These high rates and the ever-present prioritization of patient safety led to the reduced availability of tissue for investigating and refining treatment of DIPG over the last three decades. Modern estimates of morbidity and mortality from large meta-analysis are quite a bit lower. Um, these include a 6.7% transient morbidity, a 0.6% permanent morbidity, and a 0.6% mortality. And these are national statistics. The average rate of non-diagnostic brainstem biopsy for a presumed DIPG has also been estimated, and that's around 3.9%. Therefore, in light of these revised estimates for morbidity and mortality, and in light of the current state of the field in neurosurgery and neuro-oncology, a reasonable current recommendation for when to biopsy includes offering a biopsy in the setting of an atypical appearing lesion to rule out a pathology that would otherwise dramatically alter treatment strategy, and also offering a biopsy for a typical appearing lesion when it serves as the entrance requirement for an available clinical trial. The seeming simplicity of these criteria for biopsy is tempered by reality. Um, in response to a, a survey with uh, brainstem tumor images and clinical scenarios, a three-quarter majority agreement between pediatric neurosurgeons was observed in fewer than half the cases, and a median 5% of pediatric neurosurgeons would choose to biopsy a lesion they themselves designated typical with a range of 1% to 67%, quite large, and furthermore, a median 18% with a range of 4 to 100% would avoid biopsy of a lesion they themselves called atypical on the survey. Let's discuss a little further than the modern role of biopsy. Data from retrospective reviews of biopsy lesions naturally do contain selection bias because the lesions historically with atypical features were the ones that were biopsied. With that in mind, a meta-analysis of 18 studies was published with 735 biopsies in all, and they showed that certain pathologies such as the expected glioma histology was present in 84% of cases, um, however, other pathologies, including um, a primitive neuroectodermal tumor, now ETMR, ependymoma, other tumors, infection, inflammatory disease, and other neoplastic disease were present in a, in a fairly significant percentage of cases. And remember that these data are best regarded as representing the atypical appearing group of tumors. The data highlights the relevance of biopsy for atypical features. A diagnosis of an embryonal tumor with multilayered rosettes carries a more rapid dismal prognosis and requires workup, including a full central nervous system imaging, consideration of surgical resection, and complete craniospinal radiation. Furthermore, non-neoplastic conditions, for example, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, require corticosteroids as first-line treatment. So you can see that other pathologies, if they're present, would dramatically alter the prognosis and the treatment strategy. For lesions with a typical appearance, biopsy of tissue was historically designated with the standard WHO grading system between two and four. However, the body of literature at the time failed to find a meaningful association between histologic grades two through four and the overall survival or the progression-free survival of DIPG. This was initially puzz puzzling for a substantial period of time, and the lack of association uh, had many theories. Um, it was speculated uh, to derive from sampling error on biopsy, among other possible reasons. Progress in molecular and genomic evaluation of DIPG has suggested that the clinical behavior is explained by more than just histology alone. And substantial meaningful progress in our current understanding of DIPG was gained in 2012 upon the discovery of the H3K27M mutation. Therefore, 
let's focus on a brief discussion of H3K27M. The H3K27M mutation is a somatic gain-of-function mutation present in more than 80% of DIPG. It's a single amino acid substitution that occurs at the 27th amino acid on histone 3.3 or 3.1, from a polar or charged lysine, which is K, to a hydrophobic methionine, M. As of the 2016 WHO re reclassification, H3K27M DIPG has been designated a specific subset of overall diffuse midline glioma, or H3K27M mutated diffuse midline glioma, which is WHO gray 4 regardless of histology. The overall survival of K27M DIPG is significantly shorter than that of H3 wild type DIPG. And the H3K27M mutation influences prognosis to a greater extent than age, histologic grade, and even treatment. So speaking of treatment, let's progress to a discussion of therapeutic, uh, therapeutic modalities for DIPG. In the modern era, biopsy, for example, the biopsies that we perform at CHLA, can be performed using adjuncts to improve surgical safety and accuracy, including three-dimensional stereotaxis and robotic neuronavigation. Microsurgical resection is not an advantageous form of therapy for DIPG. Therapeutic benefit in DIPG has historically been derived from radiation. Radiation therapy for DIPG is delivered um, as a fractionated focal dose, uh, intensity modulated radiation therapy, to a, radi uh, to a region spanning approximately two centimeters around the tumor. Common parameters for radiation therapy include a 1.8 or two gray daily fractions over a course of six weeks, which makes up 30 fractions. And as, as a result of radiation, symptoms and quality of life do temporarily improve in approximately 80% of patients and a stabilization or reduction of tumor size occurs in approximately 50%. The overall survival is estimated to increase about three or more months as a result in radi of radiation, but as you can see, this is still very low. Even with radiation, tumor progression occurs on average three to eight months after therapy, and the time from progression to mortality remains one to four months. Modifications of the current radiotherapy regimen have been attempted, including hypofractionation or hyperfractionation, but all without substantial benefit. Improved therapies are dramatically needed for DIPG. Over 200 clinical trials have been performed using an extensive range and combination of chemotherapeutics, targeted therapies, and other modalities, for example, intrathecal chemotherapy, all without su substantial benefit as well. And as of, uh, as of June 2019, there were 28 clinical trials in the United States that were recruiting specifically for DIPG and 13 active studies uh, that were no longer pursuing recruitment. Promising new options do take advantage of the modern knowledge of the H3K27M mutation. And these include examples such as histone deacetylase inhibitors, such as panabinostat or varinostat, uh, bromodomain, bromodomain inhibitors or Jumanji domain deacetylase uh, or demethylase inhibitors like GSKJ4. Most clinical trials have, that have been reported already in textbooks, for example, targeting of PDGFRA, EGFR, or VEGFR, are, have already shown a lack of significant efficacy. Immunotherapy is also a current important topic of investigation in active clinical trials, including such modalities as vaccine therapies, uh, CAR T cell therapies, or oncolytic viruses. Our DIPG laboratory at USC CHLA and the Saban Research Institute uh, takes advantage of modern knowledge on DIPG, and we're pursuing avenues such as three-dimensional cell culture and mon modeling of the native DIPG tissue microenvironment. We do this through patient-derived multi-cell cold cultures, as well as human brain-derived scaffolds that better reflect the characteristics of the extracellular matrix and the malignant phenotype. This is moving us towards a high-throughput, patient-derived microfluidic assay for drug screening that could dramatically improve therapy in the future. Another avenue that's pursued by our research group, the Nanoscaled Neurotechnology Research Group, is nanopart nanoparticle therapies used for DIPG, as well as convection-enhanced delivery. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. The information provided here and the work that we do at CHLA is a team-based effort. There are many colleagues from the hospital staff, the physicians, nursing staff, and all of our support staff, as well as uh, individuals in our laboratory, which make up an extensive multidisciplinary team uh, that all contribute to improving the overall outcomes and therapy for, for children with DIPG. Thank you very much.